Chapter 1, Mental Health and Mental Illness. The objectives for this chapter are to discuss the history of psychiatric care, define mental health and mental illness, discuss cultural elements that influence attitudes towards mental health and mental illness, identify physiological responses to stress, discuss the concepts of anxiety and grief as psychological responses to stress. As you take a few minutes to think about the historical overview of um, psychiatric and mental illness, one of the things that you need to think about is that early beliefs um, centered on mental illness in terms of in evil spirits or supernatural or magical powers that had entered the body and had taken over. You know, and I always um, think of this, I say I think about the movie um, The Exorcist. Um, and if you've not seen The Exorcist, uh, you need to, to watch it. But um, it's like something possessing the body, and that is the that's the way historically uh, mental individuals who were suffering from mental mental illness were looked at. They were often beaten, starved, tor tortured, um, and a lot of this was done in the name of purging out the evil spirits um, or trying to get rid of them. Um, they used witchcraft on individuals. Um, they were burned at the stake because they were thought in some cases to be witches. So, you know, we have to, we look at this picture and uh, you see someone, uh, you know, looks like a child who is in a makeshift wooden cage. Or you see a group of um, men sitting in chairs with one of them that has on a straight jacket and um you know what do those images bring to mind uh if you've ever seen some of the old movies um in which they were depicted individuals with mental illness in there um you know this might be a picture that comes to your mind hippocrates associated mental illness with an irregularity in the interaction among the four humors blood black bile, yellow bile, and phlegm. And why is that that important? Because again, we're thinking it's something going on in the body or it's um, something that has invaded the body. Then during the Middle Ages, um, the mentally ill were actually sent out on the sea on sailing boats without guidance um, for their lost rationality. And they would say that this was this was called the ship of fools. Uh, and so it's just set them adrift, kind of. Uh, in Middle Eastern Islamic uh, countries, they began to establish special units or general hospitals. And these were the first known um, asylums for individuals with mental illness. And then in colonial America, mental illness was equated with witchcraft. And again, like I said, many of these individuals were burned at the stake. Um, because they felt like they were going to do harm to others, so let's get rid of them. Um, there are also, you know, pictures of the, that you have probably seen that are buildings that are cold, um, stone buildings with tall fences around them, metal beds um, with no mattress or a very thin mattress. Um, and so sometimes that's, that's that historical aspect that we see. Now, we, we've, we've evolved a little bit, um, you know, in our way of thinking um, and how we treat individuals with uh, mental illness. And so now we're treating them on an outpatient uh, basis. We know more about how medicine works with those individuals. Um, and so that, I, that's just a little historical perspective for you, but also understand that that's also where some culture comes into play that we'll, we will talk about a little bit later on. So here you see a um, picture of um, Benjamin Russ, and he's often called the father of American psychi uh, psychiatry, was a physician at a hospital, initiated the first humane treatment of individuals with mental illness in the United States. And the first hospital in America to admit individuals was, uh, with mental illness was established in Philadelphia in uh, the mid century, in, uh, uh, the mid 18th century. And then, um, you know, 
if you're from North Carolina, you're familiar with North Carolina, um, you'll also know about Dorothea Dix, which we'll talk about in just a moment. So here you see a picture of uh, Dorothea Dix. And uh, in the 19th century, she was successful in lobbying for the first for the establishment of state hospitals for individuals with mental illness. And it's been several years ago now, or quite, quite a few years ago, that uh, Dorothea Dix Hospital in Raleigh was actually closed down. But here we see um, two individuals that began to make a difference in the life of individuals with mental illness. Um, Benjamin Rush who um, established the humane treatment for individuals, and Dorothea Dix, who established for state hospitals for individuals. Now, that's not to say that there was not some maltreatment um, that went on in facilities uh, and, it, and continued, but it, these were individuals who were trying to make a, an effort to make things better for a population of individuals who, you know, for a lack of better words, were misunderstood by society because um, they just weren't considered normal by, the, by most people's standards. Uh, and so how to help them, that was the important thing. And that's what um, this course is all about, is learning how to help people um, who have mental illnesses in, um, in their life. So I'd be remiss if I didn't uh, mention Linda, Linda Richards, uh, who is considered the first American psychiatric nurse. She graduated from New England Hospital for Women and Children in Boston. She helped to establish the first school of psychiatric nursing at McLean Asylum in Waverly, Massachusetts in 1882. Um, however, psychiatric nursing was not included in the curricula of schools of nursing until 1955. So from 1882, um, when she established this first psychiatric nursing um, school, nursing school, um, it took from 1882 to, to 1955 for it to be um, included in the curricula of nursing programs, um, which is where we are today um, and still talking about it. So I want you to think about um, those things because it's important. So here we have three very influential individuals um, who made a difference in the life of uh, individuals with psychiatric illness. Before we can begin this chapter, there's a couple of things I want you to go back to um, from previous courses and think about. And one of those um, courses is your transcultural nursing course because it's important for you to understand that the concepts of mental health and mental illness are culturally defined. So they are defined by the way an individual, their values, their beliefs, um, how they were raised, the environment that they were raised in, and those things can be um, considerable when you think about tolerance or intolerance to one's um, culture or belief or value system and so that's going to make a difference when you when you as the nurse are thinking about how do I help this client who to um, sustain their mental health or how do I help this client who has a mental illness um, but based on their own culture may or may not be reluctant to seek help. Now along with that we also know that when individuals are in a state of mental health or mental illness, that they uh, experience both physical and psychological responses to stress. And so we're going to talk about the stress um, factor a little bit later on, but those are things that, you know, we can, we can touch on right now when you think about stress, think about maybe a level of anxiety that somebody is having. And that's one of the things that we're going to talk about. It's also going to look at, um, the concepts of grief along with that. So we'll, we'll discuss that as we move through the chapter. So here we go. Here you see this uh, concept of mental health that's identified by Maslow's hierarchy of need. And as I just talked about that fulfillment or, the, or that need to or desire to reach self-actualization as a fulfillment of one's highest potential. And that's what, you know, technically that's what we're all striving for is to be the best that we can be um, and to move from 
the level of physiological needs are those basic physiological needs to move towards self-actualization where you feel like you have um, reached the highest point on the pendulum and you were able to do um, feel fulfilled in everything that you do. So again, we're going back to this mental health definition. You can see it's going to be important. It's the successful adaptation to stressors from the internal and external environment. It's evidenced by thoughts, feelings, and behaviors that are age appropriate and congruent with local and cultural norms. So what does it mean to be successfully adapted? Um, those are things that you begin to think about and you say, hmm, how do I know that I have uh, adapted into society? Well, or, or I've successfully adapted. So does that mean that you are having thoughts that are um, in line with the society around you? Does that mean that um, there's no internal struggle? You know, as nurses, we always talk about our gut reaction or how we how we feel about something in a certain way or we know that there's something that's going to happen because of this gut reaction so you think about that successful adaptation to stressors um remember a few minutes ago i mentioned to you about grief and grief is a natural process that occurs when something happens and it is you know oftentimes i think we think about grief with death and dying but that's not it the loss of a job causes grief um, now, if I successfully adapt to that grief, what's going to happen? I'm trying to give you an example here. What's going to happen? I may be in a state of um, discomfort, uneasiness. Um, some might even say depression for a few weeks related to the loss of my job. But do I get to a point that I can say I've lost my job? Um, you know, whatever the reason was, now I need to move on and I start looking for another job. Um, that would be a normal response um, for most people. What would be abnormal is you lose your job and you give up. You know, you're like, I can't find another job. I'm never going to be able to find another job. So when you start thinking of something, and that's putting it very simple in very simple terms, but that would be a stressor. That job loss would be a stressor that then has caused um, feelings that you're not getting over. And so we now have moved from mental health, which is where you can um, have feelings that are age appropriate and congruent to something that is beginning to look like the realm of mental illness, which will be on our next slide. Now Horowitz um, says that there, or he describes that there are two elements that affect um, how individuals view, view mental illness. One is the incomprehensibility. It's that ability of the general population to understand the motivation behind a particular behavior. So I'm gonna just throw an example out there um, if you see someone acting erratic, but you have no clue as to why they're acting in that manner, what would you think? You know, what would come to your mind? You'd be like, why in the world is that person acting like that? Um, or, you know, if you're a person who's, who doesn't know anyone who's ever had a substance abuse problem, um, you know, you may say, why in the world would they choose drugs? You know, if you, it, it may be a hard concept. So that's that incomprehensibility is, you know, I can't understand why somebody would choose to go down the path that they choose to go down to. Go down. And then you, the other concept of that is cultural relativity. And that's the normality of behavior is determined by culture. So there are things that I'm sure that if you go back and think about your trans culture nursing class, that, um, when you were studying different cultures, you were like, oh, I can't believe that they do that. Um, for example, and this has nothing really to do with the mental illness side, but I'm going to throw this example out there, is um, that there are cultures that in Western society, we typically will, oh, a lady has a baby and the pl placenta is discarded. And I'm using that because y'all just 
finished up OB and peaked. Um, but there are other cultures where the placenta is cooked and ate by the family. There's other cultures that the placenta is actually planted, um, you know, in the yard or something um, because it's supposed to bring um, life, um, abundance of life to the family. So when you start thinking about cultural relativity, um, What's normal in one culture may be very abnormal in another culture. And how does that tie in then with the view of mental illness? So even individuals seeking out, uh, women seeking out treatment during menopause for hot flashes um, versus we women who choose not to because of a cultural belief. It's, you know, it's often men say well, I mean, I'm going to have to go through the change. I just got to learn to deal with it. That's what my mama did. And they, you know, nobody took any medicine for that. So would you say that that person's mentally ill? Well, no, you probably wouldn't. But that brings up a cultural aspect um, in Native American cultures. When people talk about having visions and hallucinating, you know, in the general realm of Western society, we would say that, Someone who's hallucinating or having visions is is definitely has um, a mental illness going on, but for that culture um, or the, and that particular group of individuals, that may be something that they look at as um, those visions are actually something spiritual and very meaningful, and so they would not see that as a mental illness. But yet, if as we uh, and as you'll learn this semester. When we start asking people about hearing voices or are they seeing things or are they hallucinating, then we start looking at that as what's going on with them because there's a mental illness concept there. So how do we define mental uh, illness? Well, a another way that it's defined is that it's a maladaptive response to stressors from the internal or external environment that's evidenced by thoughts, feelings, and behaviors that are incongruent with the local and cultural norms and interfere with an individual's social occupation and or physical functioning. So we can um, just think about something real simple. Um, substance abuse, you know, you'll hear me because that seems to be one that's easy for people to understand right offhand. But when it starts affecting your everyday ability to interact in society, or to be considered quote unquote normal um, in society, or it interferes with your physical functioning, then we start looking at that as it's a maladaptive response and there's something not right there. Another maladaptive response that we can think about um, that we'll talk about a little bit later in this chapter is grief. So grief is a very normal process. The five stages of grief are very normal. At a point when those stages um, go on for extended periods of time, then that's when we start looking at this is have, this individual is having a maladaptive response. Um, they're in a depressed state possibly for long periods of time. And so when we look at that, that's beginning to look at the realm of mental illness rather than them being able to cope um, effectively. So as we look at the physical response to stress, that physical response is the manifestation by a specific syndrome, which consists of all the non-specifically induced changes within a biologic system. So go back to what you learned a long time ago with your uh, when you're studying your neurocognitive things, um, and you were looking at in pathophysiology how the brain reacts to certain things. So we talk about this fight or flight syndrome, and what does that mean? That individual when something happens some stress response happened they either want to stand up and fight or they will want to run away from the problem and so that is you know that is a normal syndrome that happens it's in that fight or flight we all have it it comes at certain times um, when something's going on um, I would say a, an example that you might um, think about is 
is someone so frightened that they're paralyzed and they can't move or does it happen so quickly that their automatic reaction is to run away, get away, um, you know, get out of danger. So I can either stand up and face this danger or I can run away from it. And that is what happens when our bodies become in a state of stress. So if you continue to think about that adaptions, adaptation syndrome, that fight or flight um, response, there are three distinct stages. There's the alarm reaction, which is the fight or flight um, initial response. Then there is the stage of resistance. And that stage of resistance is the first stage is the person's attempt to adapt to the stressor. If this adaptation occurs, then stage three, the stage of exhaustion, is either prevented or it's delayed. And so the physiological symptoms may go away. They may disappear. Um, but if that doesn't happen, then we move into stage three, which is that state of exhaustion. And it is where that adaptive energy is completely de depleted and the disease of adaptation um, must ensure. And so what do you think is going on there? That fight or flight is your norepine norepinephrine and epinephrine response. So what would we see in that initial reaction? We may see an increase in respiration rate. We may see an increase in heart rate. Um, blood pressure may also um, go up. If that is sustained for long periods of time, then what happens? That's when glucogenesis occurs. There's an increased basal metabolic rate, and there's a decrease in your sensations of sex hormones. So you're going to have to go back, and I'm not spending a lot of time on that because you've already had that in previous courses, but think about what's going on with the body during those physical responses to stress. So again, let's talk a little bit more about that fight or flight syndrome and what's occurring. So what might you see in that immediate response? Um, does the person's eyes, does their pupils dilate? Um, is there dilation of the bronchicles where we have this increased respiration that we just talked about? Um, is there an increased force of cardiac contraction which causes increased cardiac output and the heart rate and the blood pressure changes and can go up? You know, does the person even begin to talk about the feelings of chest tightness and chest pain um, as in, in that response? Um, there is decreased gastric motility and secretions that occur. So you may begin to see a person complaining about some constipation going on. Remember, we're talking about these physio physiological responses to stress. Um, do they begin to perspire? You know, is there an increase in secretion from the sweat glands? What other responses, as you're thinking and you're reading, you think you begin to think about what you've previously learned. Um, about that immediate response and that sustained response. With the sustained response, um, the physical responses of stress occur after a long period of time, and that's what we're going to move into next. So if we see that there's a sustained physical response to stress that occurs because there's been pro a prolonged period of stress and there's a um, promoting susceptibility to diseases, what do we know happens if the body is responding to stress and it stays that way for long periods of time? Do you think that your immune system is just decreased? Well, we know that there is a decrease in the immune system and the inflammatory response uh, related to ACTH. Um, there is vasopressin that occurs, so we start building up fluid, uh, a fluid retention. There is an in increase in blood pressure. Um, there is an increase in your serum glucose and your fatty acids that occur. So that growth hormone is beginning to affect. When you think about your increased um, basal metallic rate, you have to think about your um, thyrotropic hormone responses. You also need to think about the decrease in libido. So all these things when you're thinking about stress, you may not initially think about those physical responses other than the the fight piece um, or the running away, the fight or the flight piece. But if that stress occurs for long periods of time, then this body is going to become in a weakened state. And that's where we have to start thinking about what else is going on with this person. So the person that I saw in the flight mode, um, fight or flight, the fight mode is a very different individual than I see in a person who is, 
responding after extended periods of stress is going on with them. They look different. So it's important to understand the um, psychological responses to stress. And there are two primary psychological response patterns to stress. And those would be anxiety and grief. And uh, it comes in the forms of a variety of thoughts, feelings, and behaviors that are associated with each, with each of these response patterns. And then how we adapt uh, and our adaptation is determined by the extent to which the thoughts, feelings, and behaviors interfere with an individual's ability to function. And that is to function on a daily basis. So those are important things to um, be thinking about. So let's talk for a moment about anxiety. Anxiety is a feeling of discom discomfort and apprehension related to fear of impending danger. The individual may be unaware of the source of this anxiety, but it's often accompanied by feelings of uncertainty and helplessness. So I'm going to um, compare this to that gut feeling that we have. We know that something may not be just right. And um, so, you know, nurses will say, well, my gut says blah, blah, blah. But you can become anxious about that because it's it's this sense that, wait a minute, something just isn't kosher here. And so you become uncertain and you feel helpless about what's going on. Um, it, anxiety is extremely common in our society. And, uh, and we see forms from very mild anxiety to uh, panic attacks. Um, which can be a, um, you know, a, a, a higher level of a form of anxiety. But we can go all the way up to severe anxiety, and severe anxiety then extends to periods um, for longer periods of time. So we're starting off with a mild anxiety, which is an adaptive, is adaptive and can provide um, motivation for survival. So that's where that mild anxiety comes from. It's a good thing. So when we think about Pavlov's uh, four levels of anxiety, there's mild. That's seldom you have a problem with it. There's moderate anxiety, which is this per uh, perceptual field begins to diminish. There's severe anxiety where the perceptual field diminishes greatly. And there's, there's that panic state, which is the most intense state. And with panic anxiety, the individual is unable to focus on uh, even one detail within their environment. They have misconceptions, uh, misinterpretations are common. They have a loss of contact with reality that can occur. This is also where we may get into some hallucination or delusions that may be present. Uh, the behavior can be characterized as wild and desperate. Um, their actions become very extreme. They can withdraw. When you think about the human functioning pattern and their communication, uh, these often become ineffective. The individual may be convinced that they have a life-threatening illness or they fear that they're going crazy or there's this feeling of loss of total control. Um, they're emotionally weak. Prolonged panic anxiety can lead to both physical and emotional exhaustion, exhaustion and can be life-threatening. Again, hear me there. Prolonged panic anxiety can be life-threatening. You, you wear yourself out both physically and emotionally. I would know that. Um, I would know that for uh, even for testing purposes. So as we talk about um, anxiety, we have to talk about how we adapt uh, to the levels of, of anxiety. And so if you think about at the mild level, and the individual can employ a variety of coping mechanisms to deal with stress. A few of these, including mine, is eating. So we have people that become anxious and they eat. Um, and they may go on almost like binges of eating. You know, they eat and they really don't even realize how much they're eating. Um, there are people that will drink. There are people that will sleep for long periods of time. There are people that cope with anxiety, the mild form of anxiety, through physical exercise. And so when we're looking at it from a mild standpoint, um, these coping mechanisms can be small. Now, we're not talking about, you know, I laughed and said eating. That would be me. We're not talking about eating to the point that you make yourself sick. Um, but 
people eat because of an emotional, there's an emotional tie that may be there. Food can be comforting to someone. Um, you know, of course, drinking, um, and we don't, we're not talking about drinking to excess. Um, other things that people can do is um, snapping their fingers or um, I didn't realize it for a long time until I had a colleague at work tell me one time, she said, you're driving me crazy with that pen. And I wouldn't even realize that I was doing it, but I would be clicking, I would be sitting and clicking the pen, you know, just clicking it up and down, up and down, up and down. And she said, oh my God, it's driving me crazy. And it wasn't until she pointed it out to me that I even realized that I was doing it. Um, you know, stress can be body movements as well. So those are things that you begin to think about. Now, the important thing is how does those coping uh, behaviors enhance one, uh, one's ability to adapt to a certain environment or to the, to the level, level of anxiety that they're dealing with? So one way a person may um, adapt with that anxiety or that level of stress is the ego defense mechanism. Uh, and that's very common in mild to moderate anxiety. And it it's, can include um, denial of something, uh, of, you know, forms of isolation. Sometimes you project um, on others. And those things are fairly common for us to do. And it's at that mild to moderate level that the strength of the ego is actually tested. Um, remember that our ego defense mechanism, and you should learn this way back in studying Erickson and uh, stages of development and those kind of things, um, was that we employ these for our, uh, some form of protection for ourselves. Okay, And so you may actually see uh, these mechanisms when you're observing in the clinical setting um, with your classmates, with family or friends. Um, and so you begin to think about, well, why is this important? Why is this this particular defense mechanism um, the mechanism that that individual is using? And you know, how do how are they adapting um, on an everyday basis? So here we go. If you look at the ego defense mechanisms, um, there's compensation, there's denial, there's displacement, there's identification. Um, you intellectualize something. There's introjection and isolation and or projection that we just talked about. Um, are you rationalizing something? Is there a reaction formation? Um, do you actually regress and go back to a, another state? Um, are you repressing feelings um, or suppressing something? You know, even suppressing the desire to act in a certain way. And then is there an undoing um, of things? And so those things become important as we're thinking about the clients that we may be seeing um, in the clinical setting. So if you look on page seven in your text, there is a table there with those ego defense mechanisms um, that you'll want to spend some time just looking at um, and so that you'll have a better understanding. So when you think about compensation, you know, um, is it covering up a real or perceived weakness? Denial, do we refuse to acknowledge the existence of something? Um, displacement, are we transferring our feelings uh, onto someone else or targeting someone else? With the intellectualization, it's an attempt to avoid expressing actual emotions associated with stressful situations. Um, isolation, do we separate a thought or a memory from a feeling, tone, or emotion. Projection, are you attributing that feeling or that impulse um, un that's unacceptable to oneself or to another person? So go over that table, read, read through that table um, just so that you have a better understanding of the ego defense mechanisms. And like I said, you should have already had that. This should be a review for you. So when anxiety moves to the moderate to severe level, this is the, that state of where it remains unresolved over an extended period of time, and it can contribute to a number of um, physiological disorders. Remember how we talked about that severe anxiety could be life-threatening? 
So um, go back to that. When that's extended periods of time, you get some um, psychoneurotic responses, such as um, that with anxiety disorders, somatic syndrome disorders, or dissociative disorders. Some common characters of individuals with neurosis include they are um, they are aware that they are feeling um, experiencing stress. They're aware that their behaviors are maladaptive. They're unaware of any possible physiological or psychological causes of the distress. So they're unaware of any possible psychological causes of distress. They feel helpless to change their situation and they experience no loss of contact with reality. So as this progresses, remember we're moving from this mild um, anxiety to moderate to severe levels of anxiety. We can have these things that are going on and this this is where we start getting into that life-threatening um, situations if we don't get this behavior changed. So you remember earlier we talked about that um, panic level that can relate to those hallucinations, um, those kind of things. So we start to see some psychosis building. Again, you see this is now becoming um, a severe problem. It's not just a mild case of something. It's moved to... Um, a uh, high severity level. Um, they exhibit, uh, individuals that are in um, psych psychosis can exhibit minimal distress. They're unaware that their behavior is even maladaptive. They're unaware of any um, psychological problems. They are, they are exhibiting a flight from reality into less stressful world and one that, uh, and, and a world that is, <clears throat> excuse me, one in which they begin to attempt to adapt. So think about this and say they have moved from reality to non-reality and they're trying to adapt into that non-real state. Uh, so some examples of psychosis would be um, schizophrenia, schizoaffective, and delusional disorders, which we will all talk about later um, as we progress through this semester. So earlier uh, in the lecture, I talked about um, grief and how we were going to talk about grief. And there's five stages of grief. And we typically look at Kubler-Ross, um, five stages of grief. That's the most common that we see. Denial being um, one of those stages. Now, we, we, we tend to list them in these uh, one, two, three, four, five order. But I just want you to know that stages of grief can actually come in any order. So if you think about denial, it's the stage of disbelief in which the reality of loss is not acknowledged. So um, let's just say someone who gets a diagnosis of cancer um, and everything's clear, you know, it's very evident that the cancer is there, but yet they are denying that they have it. They don't want to face that reality. So they're in that stage of denial. Uh, then there comes a stage of anger. Um, Again, like I said, these these can be mixed up. They don't have to come in a specific order. But there's a stage of anger, um, and that's that stage when envy and resentment take place. Um, so the individual is just mad, uh, mad about what's going on. Then there's that bargaining stage. And, you know, for years I've, I've used this um, as the example for bargaining. Lord, if you'll just let me live. You know, because I was talking about cancer. So, Lord, if you'll just let me live to see my child graduate. Um, or if I can just do this. If I can just make it until my child is five or my child turns 18 where I know that they're going to be able to take care of themselves. So, now we're we're in this stage of um, bargaining with, with somebody, typically a higher power. Um, we may begin to make promises. Um, to try to reverse or postpone this loss. Uh, I'll do better, you know, if you'll let this go away. Um, then there's that stage of depression, and you heard me talk a little bit about that. Uh, and with depression, there becomes desperation and disengagement um, that occurs. And a person is at a loss. They, they really don't know what to do. Um, we may see that this individual is sleeping for longer periods of time. Um, they don't want to have contact. They're isolating themselves. They're not eating like they should, those kind of things. Now, the final stage, the final stage, irregardless, is, is acceptance. Um, and at the point of acceptance, they have 
um, resign themselves to recognize that this loss is real, okay? Um, that it's it, it, that it's becoming a reality. So whatever that loss is, okay. So with those stages of grief, we have what's called uh, anticipatory grief. This is the grief process before the actual loss occurs. So you're anticipating that something's going to happen, and you already start grieving about it. Um, the resolution is the length of the grief process. Um, and that is entirely individual. So how long it takes someone to move from one um, area of resolution to another is com completely um, on an individual basis. It can last from a few weeks to years, and it's influenced by a number of factors. So what do you think are some factors that it might be influenced by? So let's think about that, going back to that culture. So the culture could um, be a a factor. So in some cultures, there's a mourning process for a widow that's a year. Uh, and so they're in mourning basically for, for a year. So that could be something that's culturally related that we would say, oh my God, that, that grief is extended for a long period of time. But for that, that individual, that's, that would be a normal process for them. So um, just re recognize that resolution is that length of the grief process. Um, and that's based on an individual, on the individual's um, belief and cultural uh, aspects. So then we have um, the experience of guilt, uh, guilt for having a love-hate relationship with the lost, uh, lot with the lost entity. Um, guilt often will lengthen the grieving process. And so you can think about this. Um, I just recently lost my grandmother. You know, when I say recently, I'm talking about in the last two weeks. Um, she was 102 years old. And um, so it's not like death was unexpected at some point. Now, she did turn have a turn for the worst that was kind of sudden. So her death was a little bit um, sudden. But, um, you know, as I was thinking about this process um, of grief, it's I have a large family. And I have grandchildren that visited my grandmother uh, quite often. And then we have grandchildren that had not seen her in probably two years. So I actually heard one of them at the funeral make the statement, I should have came and saw grandma um, more often. I should have came and saw her before she got to the point that she didn't know who I was. And so I would take that as there's a little bit of guilt going on with that individual. And so the grieving process for them may be very different than the grieving process for myself. And so that's just a personal story. Um, and you probably each have your own personal stories that you can relate to. But recognizing that guilt can lengthen um, this grief process. And then again, we talked about that anticipatory um, grieving is thought to shorten the grief process when the loss actually occurs. You already anticipated that it was going to happen. Um, you've probably already resolved in your mind that this is going to happen. And so when it does happen, um, your response to it is a little bit different. And so maybe for me, you know, with my own personal story, that's where I was. Um, it was a... a an anticipatory um, thing. You know, my grandma's 102 years old. She's not going to live forever. Uh, I would personally like for her to continue to live on. But, you know, the reality of it for me was um, my grief process started um, the moment that she could no longer care for herself the way I know she wanted to be able to care for herself because she was a very independent woman, uh, an in, a woman who was widowed more years than she was married, a woman who husband died um, in his late 40s, early 50s. I never knew my grandfather. And she raised the whole family by herself. You know, she was left with a house full of small children um, to take care of. And so she, you know, was very independent. So at the time that a couple years ago that she had a stroke, I think my grief process began for me then because it was like, 
she's not the woman that she used to be that I know she desires to be. And so her point of life changed for for her and it also changed for me. So um, am I sad that she's gone? Of course, you know, um, but I don't have guilt in her death um, because I did what I could for her. I have family members who, like I said, made the statement, I should have done things differently. So they had that little piece of guilt there. So again, a personal story, but um, one that I think is very relevant to understanding um, anticipatory grief and how we move um, through those stages. So um, the length of grief, you know, I talked uh, earlier about um, you can have maladaptive grief. So the length of grief is a response is often extended when an individual has experienced a number of recent loss and when he or she is unable to complete one grieving process before another one begins. So let's let's um let's look at something that's relevant to what's going on today with the pandemic. So um you have an individual who loses their job. So they are in some that you know there is a stage of grief um that can um be invoked because of the loss of that job, because, you know, it's a loss of livelihood. How am I going to survive? How am I going to take care of my family? Those kind of things. Then add to that um, the fact that either maybe they get sick um, or a family member gets sick um, from COVID-19. You know, I'm trying to use it something that's relevant to today. And so, boom, here's another loss that's a happening, that's happening for them. Um, and it could be that 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 individual is in the hospital. I haven't said anything about them dying. I've just said that they've gotten COVID-19. Let's just say they went into the hospital. Well, I can't see them. I can't visit them because of the state that we're in right now. So here's a lo here's another loss. And now let's just say that that was a parent um, of that individual and they were an older parent and they died because of COVID-19. So you can see how you have three losses right here on top of one another that have kind of built up. So that person probably did not get out of one stage of those five stages of grief um, before they moved into another stage of grief. And so those are things that we need to think about. So we talked a little bit about the resolution of grief process is thought to occur when an individual can look back on a relationship with the lost entity and accept both the pleasure and the disappointments in that association. So there's good, there's bad, and you can move forward. You you see that, you recognize it, and uh, you move, you're able to move forward. So there's this sense of regaining um, organization. There, you begin to pursue new interests, pursue new relationships, um, replace or have a preoccupation with energy or resolve. So if you think about resolution in, um, in the sense of a breakup um, between a husband and a wife, boyfriend and girlfriend, um, there was a grief response to the loss of that relationship. And um, now the individual in the resolution phase is moving forward. They have moved past whatever that um, sense of grief was to being able to say, okay, I'm ready to, to move on. I'm ready to move forward. And so they can develop new relationships. Um, or even they can just say, you know what? It is what it is. Um, it happened. I can't turn back the hands of time but it's time for me to move forward. So you're now res beginning to resolve um, that response. And then the last thing that we want to talk about is that maladaptive grief response that I mentioned earlier. Um, the prolonged response uh, to grief that's characterized by intense preoccupation with the lost entity. And it a lot, a lot of times will go on and on and on. Um, the the delayed or inhibited response in which the individual becomes stuck in the denial stage of the grieving process and they can't move past that stage. And then there's the distorted response. And in the distorted response uh, is in which the individual becomes stuck in the anger stage of the process. So um, I hope that you can begin to see that how this prolonged period um, 
is not adaptive, but it is a maladaptive response to what's going on. And again, um, with that individual, with that maladaptive response, we need to recognize that the individual turns the anger, anger inward. They turn it on their self. They become consumed with overwhelming feelings of despair. They become unable to function in their um, normal activities. Um, they have a delay in the living process. Um, their grief becomes distorted. Uh, and so when you think about those things, we very much go back to things that you learn in fundamentals, which is what? Um, when something interferes with your activities of daily living um, that you can control, that is a maladaptive experience when you don't try to get a handle on it. So the same thing is, um, it, it is relevant with the distorted grief reaction um, because of the fact that that grieving, uh, when it's thought to be maladaptive, when the mourning process is prolonged, when it's delayed, or when it inhibits a person's ability um, to become a functioning member of society again. And so that is chapter one um, of your text. Um, as you're studying for, for this, I would pay close attention to the summary of the key points at the end of the chapter. I would make sure that I pay attention to the um, concepts of grief, the concepts of um, anxiety, because those are um, going to be important to you when looking at tests for test purposes, and the um, physical responses, the fight or flight uh, syndrome.